O'Regan here with me. He's one of Ireland's uh, top activists. He's involved in Cannabis Activist Alliance. That's where I've met him and always on a screen like this. And uh, because I don't know, COVID was been, has been around for so long, it seems that this is where I've been uh, uh, operating. And uh, so anyway, John O'Regan, you've, uh, you've got quite a bit of, uh, I had to do a bit of research easy to find John O'Regan online. You've got quite a bit of press out there. Yeah, yeah. I've been in a few newspapers and had my troubles with <laughs> exactly. the law a few times. Let's yeah. go back to that. I want to go back to, to the start and get to know you a little bit, man. And uh, so you were out in Holland, like myself. I spent many uh, years out there. So I should leave. Five years. And I was Five there. years. There you go. I, I moved there and I got a job with Phillips in Nijmegen in 1985. My first job out of college. And I mean... <sighs> knew nothing about cannabis. I mean, I'd come across it once before then. Uh, I got a, someone gave me a pinner for my birthday in 1985, but I mean, there's an I, old word. the people I was hanging out with, they were like, oh, cannabis. Oh. So, I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't get any, I kind of went to sleep with it, put me to sleep rather than have any fun time with it. Like, but um, I said, 1985, I, I graduated, moved to Holland and um, I mean, after work, I'd uh, on a beautiful day like we have here today in Ireland, I I I get down to the, uh, one of the local coffee shops and pick up a, a gram and head back to the flat and have a smoke and listen to a bit of music and uh, totally cool. I mean, there was no big deal about it at all. But very kind and um, then moved back to Ireland in 1990 and I went around and I was pissed out of my brain going around from pub to pub in Cork looking for I had a job in Cork. I was looking for um. Uh, a bit of cannabis or looking for, and, and I mean, I, eventually I met uh, very young people. I mean, I was about, I'd been about 30, that's just 26, 27. And these were 18, 19 year olds inside. And Sir Henry, remember Sir Henry's in Cork? You probably I do indeed. And I've, uh, I was there at its height for quite a while. I used to live down in Cork and I was in, oh, right. I was in Sir Henry's when it was the pumping. Uh, I moved back to Cork in 1990. So uh, I literally would have been right at that peak. time I was there. Exactly. So, yeah, 19, 1990, I, I moved back to Cork in 1990 and spent uh, work for a year before the, the factory shut down and um, then spent a bit of, you know, did, did, that's when I kind of went off into my own thing after that. But um, we would we, we would have probably, if you were in Cork in 1990, I guarantee you, we would have probably been there on the same night in the same place. I mean, Jesus, we never met. Wow. As I said, the, when, I, when, I, when I moved back to Cork and uh, I mean, I, I was looking for a bit of cannabis and Went around to various pubs. Eventually, got. I was told, well, if you turn up tomorrow in the in the Peace Park, and um, there'll be somebody you search about there. And so I went around, and uh, the next morning, and took fucking dying with a hangover, and went into this place. And I mean, there were literally there was about a dozen, well, half a dozen to a dozen very young teenagers, and um, and they were I could see them burning the <laughs> burning the hash at, at the bottom, look keeping it low, like. And I said, I went over to them. I said, any any chance there's anybody selling cannabis? They pointed me over, and the guy standing by a wall, looking like he was just hanging out, nothing, doing nothing at all. And I got my first twenty spot illegally, my first my first illegal cannabis in. Yeah, and he was about sixteen. He was no more than sixteen at that stage. Like, I mean, I saw him many years later, and he was, he'd obviously been to prison because he was bald. He was. Jeez, he load of muscle. I'm like, and um, really harder as well. When I first met him, when he was 16, he was like, "You're very easy going." And um, told me where to, where he used to deal out during the every night during the week. He'd be up around by the Shandon Bells, like so. I mean, this was totally foreign. I mean, uh, do you know something? I mean, it's something. This is going to sound really strange, no? But I mean, buying cannabis in Holland is boring. I mean, you just go along, you up, you pick, you, you know what you want. You, you they they show you what they have there. I mean, it's like buying a bag of sugar. Like, I mean, it's nothing. Whereas in yeah. Ireland, you're going down to a park or you're going up to Shandon Bells at night and it's dark, you're watching them. It's like an adventure. I mean, yeah. if they wanted to give this adventure to teenagers, I mean, you that if they've given them this, it's like giving somebody the keys to a hot rod car. Like, I mean, all of a sudden they're they're, they're into the drug world and whoa, I'm doing this. And, and you've got guys, like, I have guys like 12, 13 years of age talking to me like they were fucking 30 year old veterans. Like, I mean, this is the... Yeah. The, the, it, it, it's it, heavily glamorized in Ireland. I yeah, think yeah. I mean, things it's, like Love Hate, that TV series, and a bunch of there's a lot of things in Irish culture that's totally glamorizing uh, this this situation and this so called drug war we have and all of that. So it is for young kids. They have a you know they want they, they want the money they want the cars they want all the things that this 
world is supposedly offering. And uh, so, that yeah, it's horrible. Well, they're gifting. I mean, the government don't realise it, but they're gifting these teenagers. I mean, a young teenager, you know, you remember being a young young lad yourself. I mean, you're trying out all kinds of things. You're trying football, golf, tennis, girls, obviously. Um reading different new books, stuff that you think you think are more, uh, I remember I was interested in reading Dr. Zhivago, I mean, kind of stuff when I was 13 or whatever it was, like, I mean, teenagers are going to experiment with everything that's out there, like, and I mean, if you, I mean, giving them, uh, making drugs illegal is like giving them, uh, it's like, it's like handing them the keys to it, as I was saying, a, hot, a fantastic car, I mean, they're going to, of course, they're, I mean, you'd, I, I'd actually be worried about kids that would be staying away from drugs, I mean, is there, they, you know, that, that there's whole, that, that, I mean, are they afraid? You know, I mean, I'm the only guy I ever came across here in Kilkee that was like, um, obviously shouldn't be into cannabis or anything like that because he, he gets paranoid when he, when he does anything like, you know, or, or at least he did when I do, he's moved away now, he's gone up to Galway or God knows where he is like, but I mean, um, there are people that just doesn't suit, you know, I mean, and, uh, but you can find, I mean, I, I'd most have heard. Also, well, well, I, sorry, John, to, to speak over there, but uh, to be honest, this is a little bit about uh, prohibition mm-hmm. creates this situation where yeah, people, yeah. these guys are no education, no idea what strain does what, no idea what's happening in the culture of cannabis and have no idea it's blind boy has a great line i think he's he's talking about the guys that are selling in ireland they're going it's a uh, ah it, it, so blind boy asks what's the strain do you want it or not is the yeah, strain exactly. yeah 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 i mean I, i've been smoking cannabis for like 30 years at this stage like and there are times when i grow in cannabis that i get get a strain and jeez it's just I can't. It gives me insomnia. I can't sleep because the because of it. And uh, I mean, I I if if it was just one type, if I just bought a a, a, a ten bag over in a coffee shop in Holland, I say, okay, I won't I won't ever go near that again. But I've got yeah. like fifty grams of this stuff sitting there, and I'm <laughs> I can either throw it out or I can try putting in more, putting in less, and you know diluting it and stuff like that. But I mean. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, 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 whatever problem, I mean, it's one of the things that if you're anybody who's into, um, into doing social work and, and helping people with their problems is that one of the, the major thing you have to remember uh, is that, first of all, you don't know their story. I mean, that, but the major thing you have to keep in mind at all times is that whatever else you do, whatever, whatever you say, try not to make anything any worse <laughs> because it, I mean, it, it, and 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 the government's response to the difficulties that they're having with, I mean, if you have a teenager or 25 year old, whatever age they are, who's having a problem with um, with uh, a particular drug, be it cannabis or whatever it is, then is, are they making things any, are they're actually making things worse as, as a means to making things better? It's like, it's like the flipping medieval times, the Spanish Inquisition, like, I mean, they, yeah. they, they see a problem and, and we try to make it as difficult and as horrible for everybody as possible in an effort to discourage them from, from so, and then they complained about, about all these people, these casualties, and they said, well, these casualties would be, would, could, would it be easier for them to get help if it was legal or if it was illegal? I mean, if, if it's illegal, then they're going to be very wary about saying to their doctor, geez, I, I've tried to get... Because, I mean, I, I, you mentioned that before we came on there that about Joe Rogan. This isn't a four-hour podcast, you know, we're not going to talk a little bit <laughs> here. But like, long even, former, we're not that long. <laughs> well, 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 there was a, Joe Rogan gave a story one time about a guy he knew. He didn't say, he wasn't a good friend of his friend, but somebody he knew. And... Um, who smoked a joint and for three weeks was gone, was absolutely mind-bendingly paranoid psychosis. He, he was he, incredible. So there are people out there. I mean, Joe Rogan wouldn't have said that, pass off a bullshit story. Like, so, I mean, I'm inclined to believe him when he says that there are people who just absolutely does not suit and those people would be miles better served by a, a, a legal system than the current one we have at the moment. Right, that's the point. And yeah. that's the point. And so I'm here two hours from uh, from Dublin, you know, I'm in Barcelona. I'm, uh, I'm uh, very, very au fait with the whole world of the Cannabis Social Club, which to me is the greatest model. If we're talking just cannabis, it is the greatest model in the world. And, uh, and this is often, I often get a little bit uh, annoyed about 
uh, people that, and particularly in Ireland around this citizen assembly that's going on at the moment where people Portuguese Portuguese has Portugal has a, a, a decrim scenario but decrim to me is pro crim you know there's no uh, the, the, the all you can find any drug as soon as you walk out of the train st in station in Lisbon you'll be approached and you'll be uh, do you want what do you want do you want that's another yes, thing yes, that yes, I noticed yes. that you uh, that you made a reference to in one of the court cases that I was reading about is that when you took when you're with a, a, a dealer from the illicit trade, they have all the other drugs. So they yes, and yes. that's you know yet there you're going to a shop with everything in it. And uh, the very first night I ever tried LSD, it was out, outside Sir Henry's. I was just sitting down across the road from Sir Henry's on the, on the curb, and uh, there was this uh, late about 20, 21 years of age, this guy came up to me and uh, asked me, was I interested in some acid? And I, 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 I'd, I'd never gone near acid before. And I tried to buy it in Amsterdam once, but got nothing of it. But um, but I I, I tried, I, I I took four tabs of acid at about two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I went back to back to my flat, not knowing what was going on. And I lay down in bed thinking, and, and you know, so I just started laughing. I was in bed going to sleep and I just kept, I laughed for about half an hour nonstop. Like I got up the night after that and started taking pictures of everything and, posing things and making for all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't have thought of it. I mean, I had a camera for like five years. That's like just like point out to uh, uh, viewers that four tabs of acid, if they, if it's any kind of acid, is not not a recommended dose. And uh, it, uh, but uh, in this case, John, yeah. Oh, yeah well, I mean, I, I, I really went when I was living in Cork. I mean, if I was doing mushrooms in Cork, 200 would be a very mild that I mean, yeah. four, five, 600 would be I mean, I went out to the countryside one time with on, on about six or seven hundred mushrooms, and Jesus, I mean, every single car that passed me, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? Next, hey, I mean, the talk was this madman. Um, but like, um, oh yeah, I mean, it, the I remember hearing about Terence McKenna. He used to call these. Um, he distinguished between these different times you take like five or six or a thousand mushrooms uh, and uh, you know just say a nice 20 i mean nowadays i mean a couple of years ago i i had just 40 mushrooms and that was and jeez i mean i i think it's the, the my old brain it's it's it reacts to, to these things i think it's, they're very unpredictable john i mean i spent a lot of time in northern ireland and i did mushrooms for years and uh, uh mushrooms are quite quite unpredictable but uh to be honest uh, i Actually, it's a, it's a strange thing. We're talking about Holland and coffee shops and head shops in Holland. Mm -hmm. They would have a, they have a selection of mushrooms that you can buy, and they're they're funny. There's about there's four the mushrooms. Uh, this is my memory. Four mushrooms, which one is Mexican, one is uh, and one of them is Irish. And the Irish mushroom that's sold in in head shops in 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 Holland is is the strongest Mexicans I used to love love the old Mexicans they were just like a buzz an extra buzz uh add a bit of add a bit of a giggle to a group of friends and uh but yeah uh, look mushrooms are unpredictable you know well but, they, they're a good kick in the arse if you're you know I mean you, you could be if you have anything going on I mean that's why they're why they were originally thought of as the most amazing therapeutic tool back in the 1950s I mean they were yeah. there's articles in newspapers and, and in magazines about the, the scientific breakthroughs that could be made with these and and we're doing research up right up until the 1960s and then just gone you know they're all made illegal and that's it's different. coming around again you know yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, coming yeah. around again strong I even had I've had a, the very first talk the second talk that I did in this round of talks was a guy from uh, UCD of all places uh, who was a, a man, an Iranian a uh, young medical doctor who's uh, actually they're studying uh, effects of uh, on P psilocybin on PTSD in, in UCD. I couldn't believe it because I've been to UCD. I've actually met a lady called Viola Br Brunatelli. I met her here in Barcelona at a, at a, at a, a, a conference. She's, a, a, she's a writer of, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, she's Italian, obviously, but she was, I met her here in Barcelona last year, and she had spent the previous six months in Dublin, in UCD, and she's a scientist, and they wouldn't allow her to study uh, CBD in UCD. And uh, and so she's here, <laughs> yeah. and the the conference was amazing. It, it was a thing called C Days, and it took takes place in a university here called uh, it's a UPC. I think it's something like a polytechnic, and uh, and it was an amazing conference because it was all it was almost like an innovation academy, which I was actually in UCD Innovation Academy, and uh, but it's certainly it was certainly no no cannabis. The one here in Barcelona is absolutely devoted to everything about cannabis, the plant, about hemp 
about all of those businesses. And so you know, the students are making pitches for venture capital to venture capitalists to make, uh, you know what I mean? And so that's it's all out in the open. So Viola comes on, not able to do anything in Ireland. She's now moved to Barcelona and, and she's able, she's talking in a, in a, in a, on a stage with five grown plants, mature plants, you know, across the front of the front of the stage. Yeah, I mean, in a I've city seen, with over two hundred uh, cannabis social clubs. I, I've seen articles written by her. She's she's uh, very productive. Very, there you go. Very fantastic person. I've never met her or even spoken to her, but I I, I follow her when when whenever she has anything any post up. Um, they're well. Oh, yeah, she has a. She's just uh, la launched a book, I think, and the book I think a book on CBD. What she was studying and what she was trying to study in UCD, but because of Irish. Uh, repressive nature of Irish kind of you even inside universities that's the shocking thing so even in academia we uh, we are not allowing people to to research into into this and thankfully that's why it was such a surprise to hear Manny that they're actually looking into uh, uh, PTSD with psilocybin very surprised well they, 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 it, it's a common thing I've, I've heard uh, Professor David Nutt which is like the I mean he he <laughs> His report back in 2010, uh, 2009, whatever it was, um, I mean, that that is, is the gold standard. I mean, there's yeah. one thing you hear all these, it's very easy to, for, to bamboozle people with statistics, but there's no one has ever yet managed to disprove. There was, there was one mistake in, in, in the paper that he wrote and they corrected that mistake. And uh, and subsequently in the 10 years since has been known, but has managed to disprove or to seriously challenge his findings. and. I mean, at the the what you hear these. There was a very interesting talk the other night about um, uh, on on the Tonight Show and uh, Garth McGovern. I'm sure you've heard of Garth McGovern, Doctor Garth McGovern, our and, only doctor. <laughs> well, he he he's one of these guys that just talks common sense and 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 the facts, yeah. like. And he's on a panel with a guy who's I I remember him back in the 1970s. He, he's he's been around forever, like with anti he's anti tobacco, and, right about vaping. And exactly, it was it was a, they were discussing vaping and. The the guy who was trying who who who's trying to ban the vapes, not the bringing in the law banning vaping uh, for eight, under eighteens was like he he was bringing forward. He said we've proven this. We have this peer reviewed article, and then Garvin McGovern would say, well, yes, but there there's nothing actually been proven. You're you're he didn't actually. I mean, scientists don't call one another liars. They the worst they say is they just don't believe you. <laughs> that's, the, yeah. that's the worst they ever say. That that's I mean, which which is a terrible insult. You know that that if you put forward in a thesis and someone says to you, we don't, I don't believe it. That I mean, it, it it on a panel show it doesn't sound that dramatic, but among scientists that would be the gravest of insults i mean that you could i mean yeah, yeah. You, you never call somebody a, a liar or, or or because then you're leaving yourself open to being accused of you know i mean they could get legal after that like but um well i i put myself in in the shoes of um who, who's our tarnished at the moment we believe right because the Taoiseach and michael martin and i mean michael martin is, is going to be in a couple of years time w walking around doorsteps and he's going to meet a lot of people are going to say to him geez this kind of a stuff that we you know i mean they 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 will go on they they'll have their fears for well they might be groundless but they are they they, they genuinely believe in 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 these things that that kind yeah. of dangerous and stuff and he, and and he he will be able to come back come back to them whatever happens between now and the next election he will be able to say to them that he he'll be able to show through the citizens assembly and through delay tactics and all the rest of it that he's been He's not rushing this at all, and that oh, everything is going by the scientific uh, advice. So, I mean, they're they're going to keep if they don't if they were to jump headlong into this and say, "Bang, we're going to make we're going to be world leaders in this. We're going to legalize hemp. We're going to legalize cannabis. We're going to make sure that it's on the medicinal access program." If he went hell for leather to do that, he would find himself in the doorsteps, and he'd have there's a good 10 percent 20 percent of the population would would be horrified you know i mean they're yeah. i mean i'm not surprised i mean I'm, I've, I've i've said this story to many people but like during the 1970s like i knew nothing i was i was only like six seven eight years of age like and i mean i knew nothing about drugs but i thought i thought they were the most terrible thing in the world you know, they were jeez i mean i mean every 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 one of the bad guys on a on, on tv they were all drug barons addicts. Or addicts and stuff i mean this incredible um there was such an amount of negative hype about it that i as a as a as a as a child even though i knew nothing about drugs i knew that they were so terrible they were a horrible evil thing altogether let's so, talk a little bit about that john because that kind of brings it brings a little bit of the picture together which is because i'm i'm uh, i'm 
uh, enjoying cannabis. I don't call it using. I, I'm enjoying cannabis since I'm 13, you know, 13. And literally 35 years ago, uh, I had to go to court in uh, after a trip to tip, which is the first trip to tip, where they just had stop and search on the on the campsite. And uh, and and that was uh, a lot of people my age. Who's at who's at festivals? Young eighteen year olds, you know, people that starting out their lives. And in that court case, when I went to eventually go do that court case, uh, the the guy, the solicitor I had at the time, he said to me, he said, "Did you have it on you?" We're kind of having a bit of a, a, a rushed job, you know, to try and kind of say, "Did you have it on you?" And I'm going to do, but it was only this. And he said, "Look, it doesn't matter." He said, "This guy is after is after putting away twenty seven people that were caught at that were caught at that very first trip to tip." So that's 30, uh, that's, I don't know what the uh, exact number is, but it's about 35 years ago. So yeah. don't, nothing has changed. And then at the first weekend of the Citizens Assembly this year, I, watched, I was watching a, a, a cop and he was going, he was talking about the value of, of, of stop and search yeah, and yeah. how we desperately need it and it has to be in place. And you're kind of going, my God, you know, do you not, what do you not get here? How can you not progress in 35 years? And uh, all the people that have been criminalized, I think somebody's put figures like hundreds of thousands uh, that have been criminalized in Ireland in those 35 years. And so you're talking, we're the same, practically the same age. I mean, you're much older, John, to be, to be honest. Look, look, I'm look, nearly 16 at this stage. No, next, next 16 next birthday. In Ireland. When was your first... Uh, you know, infraction with uh, well, the boys and well, I, I Well, to cut a long story short, I I, I moved to Kilkee in 2015, and there you go. Uh, within within a couple of of uh, of uh, months of, or less than that, about six weeks, I was knocked off my bicycle, and then that then it happened. Uh, uh, and so there was I, they, there was a report made. There was a hit and run. The car the car drove away. But so the guardie were involved and. There was one right. young guard there who said he'd do his utmost to find out what it was. He checked out all the video cameras and couldn't find anything and uh, of all the shops that were around the place. And so about six months later, he showed up at my door to, to tell me that he that he'd done everything he could do and he couldn't do anymore. And uh, so things that was just the way things were. But I was just after it was at just at dinner time and I was just smoke, smoking a joint. And I was going, fuck, I can't let the guards in here. So I just I just sat there and pretended not to hear him. You know? <laughs> And they they twig what was going on. They came back the next day, the same time the next day, and um, and uh, found uh, several plants growing. And that was in 2016. And I was went. I got. I was into the district at that stage with my first offence. So I went to the district court. And I mean, I I hadn't a clue. Like I mean, geez, uh, you were going to court. What do you do? I mean. No, no. I had a bit of a read, and you had thirteen, which according to the court records, right? So I had a bit of a read to, in my research. I do research on these okay, topics. Good man. All right, I didn't realize you could find that. <laughs> and you had thirteen mature plants in in that case in two thousand and sixteen. Oh, mature. They, they, were were valued, they had a me totally mental valuation of eighteen thousand. I think it was eighteen thousand euros or whatever but that was the first time i don't know what what the value right. is but and you want to hear something really tragic the one of them i'd never before i mean it's never happened before or since there was one of them the the glue you, you couldn't touch the cola because the, the glue there was so much like, resin the, the amount of resin oh, that was just i was almost dripping off it and that ended up in some skip or some incinerator like i mean it was it was a tragic I mean, i'll never forget it was blueberry and i'd never i've you're never, lamenting, I'd never you're lamenting your plants well i've never i mean it, i i i'm a terrible gardener to be honest with you like i mean yeah. i might know a lot about how to set up a, a, a cannabis business and how to do it and how to do it cheaply and make a lot of money out of it but i'm a t hopeless gardener so i mean um the chances of my ever again having having plants that resinous and that, that I mean uh, but like um, that was 2016 so I got went to the district court and you told him it was bananas unjust and absolutely absurd yeah I mean I was at, at, at one, at that, well in the, in the district court there was uh, you can kind of get away with things a bit more you can kind of there's a bit of repartee between the yeah, um, look at the your judge experience. And, and yourself I mean some of them can be sound as a pound I mean they're, they're some of them are grand like I mean they're they even give you. If, if I, at one stage, I, at one court case, I was represent. I decided to represent myself just to see what would happen. And the judge gave me plenty of leeway to and and explained to me how, how, when, what to do and how to question. You're still in court, John. I'm going to interrupt you. You're still in court, and it's not good enough, you know. And well, I mean, to, to give you an, give you an indication of the last day I was in court, 
I mean, what is one of the things that really struck me, whatever about 37 people get, which is bad enough. I mean, 37 people having their lives ruined. But like in, in the court, the court were three other cases on the same day as myself. Now, I can't remember all of them, but one of them was a guy caught with child porn. Another was a guy who was accused of rape. And then there was another very serious crime. I can't remember what it was about, but it was, uh, I remember walking out the door, we listened to this, like, geez, when I, my case was over, listen to this, like, I mean, um, so, I mean, there are, there are the circuit court. Really crime. Well, it, the circuit court is for very serious crimes. And, right. and, and uh, I mean, they're, what are they bringing in somebody who's, the worst that I could possibly be doing is I might be the odd time giving somebody a bit of a, handout you know if somebody was stuck for a bit of a smoke like I mean but I mean as a judge said himself like when he was summing up my case there's no signs of wealth at all I mean I I have a bicycle that's it, you know I mean I'm never going to uh, even if someone gifted me a car I couldn't keep it on the road I couldn't afford to like so I mean I mean there's no signs of wealth there there's there's no I mean yeah, I know, I get, case, there's people should. coming. There's, I mean, if if anybody who's dealing, you know, and if you're dealing from your house, then you'll have people coming and going all day long. Like, I mean, you didn't have you didn't have one of these jackets, these uh, these puffy jackets that I believe everybody has to have in, well, in, in, in the yeah, Irish drug world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, as I said, so I mean, I was really struck when you were talking about all these people. Like, the same thing happened in Electric Picnic last year, even though it was supposed supposedly there were there was a drug testing center there, and the, and the guard were supposed to be hands off. 200 people, John. 200 people. 200, was that? 200 deep? people. 200 people went to court after electric picnic, even though we had a, a like the, the bin, what did they call the bin, the amnesty bin, and all of that thing. But uh, I've yet to have uh, Graham de Barra on this. Graham would have been uh, behind that. But I had Natalie O'Regan. And Natalie okay. is a, like, you know, Natalie. And she's uh -huh. a wonderful independent with testimony and intelligent. <laughs> Intelligent, yeah. I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't think that there's many stupid people in uh, in knocking around this whole scene. All that image of, you know, uh, stoners and all of that kind of thing. I mean, it doesn't really it doesn't really uh, fit with most of the, the people. A lot of intelligence out there. You've spent a lot of time in college. You um, know, I don't. I'm I'm doing a, a thing at the moment in computer software. I mean, I did my master's degree uh, a year and a half ago. What's your master's? Um, it was in, well, I, I eventually, it was um, um, hired, it was an agricultural and inter entrepreneurship. I, 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 I basically had to start a business out of it, like, and I came up with this amazing idea. Well, it's not amazing. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it was a reasonably good idea uh, of, of, of an app for people who were, in, you know, who were taking cannabis for pain. And at the moment, there's a very simple way that people um, with their app, they can, they, is it very are they feeling in terrible pain or a or small or little bit of pain it's 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 fine i mean what they're doing is okay but i mean i i, the, I got an idea for a nap so i'm i'm now doing that that was for my master's degree a year and a half ago and i'm now doing a course in computer software hoping to implement that um i'm hope so that was my idea until i started the course and i real and and after doing the course for about three weeks that was back in february when i started it i realized that not only was i even if I did a brilliant course and got A pluses, I mean, I'd I'd still need about two or three years industry experience to be able to have to to have the wherewithal, the knowledge and skills to be able to act really do a proper. I mean, there's no point doing a half hour job. Like, I mean, so I'm 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 studying all the hours I can just to get. It's like st running to keep still because like they're. It's a very, I mean, the whole, it's a totally new field to me, computer software, and it's, uh, geez, it's tough. Uh, I mean, these are not easy, John. Our, uh, our elasticity has, uh, I mean, I just finished during that COVID years. I spent my COVID years doing, I ended up doing two postgrads in this space of cannabis, in developing this Irish cannabis clinic. Easy, and yeah. I was after doing a, a course in, in on history of uh, medical cannabis in how the University of Colorado. And so in the last, so then I did UCD Innovation Academy. Then I did Trinity, which was specifically on healthcare. And I really wanted to have a look at what's going on in the world of uh, the institutions like Trinity in terms of healthcare and how cannabis would sit with them, because it's still uh, completely marginalized. Uh, it's like the girl, Viola. She's, you know, she can't, she couldn't uh, study CBD. That's what she's written. That's the book that she's written. She's got a very in-depth, a uh, uh, paper-filled uh, book on 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 
uh, on real science of CBD. And she wasn't allowed to do that in, in, in university in Ireland. And this is, the, this is the shocking thing that when you kind of, you, have, you want, it's only when you get into these institutions and you only, it's only then that you begin to understand the barriers that are kind of uh, built up. And we obviously in the South of Ireland, uh, we have, we've got such a, um, it's not a reliance, but we have such a, um, we have all this massive tax revenues. You never stop hearing about how rich Ireland is and all of this thing. And an awful lot of it is, is pharma. And there's, I think there's something like 80,000 direct pharma jobs in Ireland and those direct pharma jobs, all big money jobs. And they've got a, a subsidiary of a, like of services kind of industry that's feeding into that, into that whole, that, all that pharma world. So they're a huge lobby and, uh, and our, politicians, visionless politicians, as I see them, I mean, they haven't got it. There is no vision in this country. And uh, and that's a shame because that's even the likes of Eamon Ryan is about, <laughs> is about the only one, but he gets ridiculed for talking about uh, south, -facing, south facing window boxes. <laughs> and he's actually just done something I read about yesterday that's the more sensible thing. About. The only objection that I've heard against uh, uh, police, Gardaí, having, uh, um, it's not body armor, it's uh, uh, having a facial recognition, facial recognition cameras yeah. on, their, on, their, on their bodies. And so Ryan, it uh, must be said, is the only person who stood up and, and, and has opposed that. And he's in government, but he's the only one that's made, him, made his voice uh, loud on that. And that goes back to the dude at the, at the Citizens' Assembly on the first weekend of the Citizens' Assembly who was, had no problem with stop and search, who had no problem with that. And it's, you know, there is a problem with stop and search. And if you don't get it, that, it, that the, how, what the problem is and what, it, what, what, how, what an infringement on people's rights that's involved in these things, then that's, that's an issue. I think, I think it, would only, it would only come home to people when, if, 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 if stop and search was, was applied equally to everybody in different areas of town. I mean, if, if somebody driving a, a, a Merck or BMW was just as likely to be stopped. I mean, Martin Conte described a, a situation when he was driving up somewhere and I mean, he made the mistake of saying, of, of, tr of trying to placate them by saying, okay, I've got a small little bit here. And next thing they thought, I mean, he thought at that stage that they'd just say, okay, well, thanks for being so honest and sparing us having to, well, Jesus, they did, they, they went the total 180 degrees opposite direction. They decided, well, if he's willing to give up that amount, that this, this bit to us, that must be because he's hiding a huge amount. So they had the back seat out, they took the car to bits and found nothing, obviously. They might've found some small specks on the floor, but. I mean, if, if people in living in Leafy, Fox Rock, and which is a place I've never been to, but I've heard mentioned so many times, if there's the, these beautiful parts of Dublin, if they were being stopped and searched just as often as, I mean, if a bunch of kids coming home from tennis practice were uh, were being stopped, like a bunch of lads were ha just hanging outside the local shopping centre in Dundrum or, or in Ballymun or something like that. I mean, th then people would say, hold on a second, how come the Gardaí are, co are constantly harassing our children? I mean, but because it's happening in this poor part of town where people don't, where... where, where it's where also a little bit this courthouse poor box donation. Like, I guarantee you all of those 200, because we're Ireland is quite a middle class kind of society. Everybody who's at Electric Picnic, for instance, this is a for instance. So yeah. everybody who's at Electric Picnic, how much is the price? How much is the tickets for that? It's about 200, over 200 euro or something for the weekend ticket. So, I mean, you're not stuck for a few quid. Mammy and daddy of the, the guy who's the, the, the teenager who's at Electric Picnic is not stuck for a few quid. So when they rock up to, uh, to court the week afterwards, and then uh, it's, not, it's not a big deal to pay, uh, you know, throw money into the courthouse poor box. And that's, and, that's and people don't people don't really I don't know how much people understand this, but like judges have prejudice as well. They were brought up they were when they they were, I mean they were kids too, and they got this anti drug message from their time. They were kind of because I mean when at one very interesting part of the trial, my last court case, the um the uh, the prosecuting uh, 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 prosecutor was asked the guard about um about the grow um the part where I was growing it in the flat. And he said it was just a room in the back of the house, or the back of the flat, like, and uh, and and it was a grow a grow room. And then he, he was getting no reaction out of the judge. And 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 grow house. Then the judge, oh yes, grow house. The, the judge for so, that twigs something in his brain. Like so, I mean, if you got if you're one of these kids who's got who 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 can afford to go electric picnic, who can afford the five or six hundred euro poor box donation, 
they're ninety nine percent certain they can they, they brought along a solicitor with them that day as well. You know, whereas if you're coming from a poor part of town, you're just going to show up in whatever gear you've on you. The judge is going to take one look at you and see no solicitor and. It's more work for the judge as well. And judges are human beings as well. Like, so, I mean, if you're you're making work for them and uh, what you and I don't appreciate enough, I think, is that, and what most people who smoke cannabis probably don't appreciate is that for the Gardaí, I mean, we're no different from somebody robbing houses, like, or or, or harassing people or or sexually assaulting. I mean, we're, we're, we're criminals, like, I mean, we're, we, and, and, and they can't just give us a free pass, like, so, um, I get that, and I get that a lot of the, I get the lot of the Gardaí are cool with it. You know that that's you know they, they, it's but the the Gardaí are having a tough job now because of the criminality. And where does the criminality come from? The criminality is the dangerous thing, mm -hmm. and that criminality is amplified by prohibition. And this is the big the big issue. Who mm -hmm. put the, who put the kid the, the teenager into the it chopped him up in bits and put him in a put him in a suitcase? How does how does that kind of, that level? of crime how does that happen well i mean I, 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 there was a, a un report uh, in 2017 and they, they they worked out the number of i've seen i've seen in two different places where they got they just figure 575,000 people died worldwide in 2017 as a result of um uh, of it's either needle sharing it was, it was problem getting infections from needle sharing or, or sure. overdosing so i mean if you, if you if 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 some genius scientist came out there in in next week and said I've got this cure for the if that for for all the harms that drugs will that do that we we we'll this amazing thing but it'll only kill about half a million people a year they they be, be wheeled up to the to, to the nut house like you want to kill you you're willing to kill half a million people a minimum half a million people every year in order to to save. Uh, uh, the mental health and possible schizophrenic reaction to all these different drugs. That so I mean, you think is this is the greatest sort of lunacy of all time? But it's it's like the frog and you know the metaphor of the frog in the in 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 the, in the pan of cold water. I mean, when it's done gradually. I mean, when it was it was it's. I mean, I read one of the things I did over the last uh, year before last year rather was that I read about the history of 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 drug prohibition back from the opium wars back in the, in the 1800s, and I mean it's just slowly, but I mean. Slowly but surely, I mean, like for instance, when 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 marijuana was made uh, illegal in 1937 in the United States, they didn't make it illegal. Everybody thinks they made it. They didn't. What they, all they did was they they created a stamp act so that you had to buy you had to buy this stamp to get to be allowed to grow cannabis. And of course, nobody they were not, they didn't issue anybody with stamps. So that's so. I mean, they, but they couldn't make it illegal because the I forget there was laws or something to do with personal privacy or or bodily autonomy, some relation to one of those two um, uh, topics. We're also talking. We're also talking like the plant was was the was behind hemp, which was one of the biggest uh, was everything. Huge. Was, yeah, yeah, huge. Yeah. It was a massive it industry. Was, massive, yeah, massive wow. industry, and uh, and and you know another thing that was uh, that prohibition just kicked down the road, and all progress with hemp has been taught, stalled right up until the, the present day. Uh, and within these talks, I had Chris Allen from the Hemp Federation of Ireland. And, uh, you know, I mean, she's a hell of a good represent representative, it must be said, for Ireland in this in the hemp industry. But she's, uh, you know, they're going crazy. And she spends a lot of time with the EU in, uh, uh, you know, at different, you know, plenaries and meeting at the Europe on a European level. And uh, it's still shocking. And even though we have a climate crisis, we have... <laughs> I, I remember the first time I, I came across I came across Chris. Uh, she was talking about this this whole this when this whole this thing started up called the novel foods, and they were trying to make maintain that uh, cannabis couldn't be introduced as a food stuff because uh, it had to go through this novel foods because it, it was a new a new uh, phenomenon a new new ingredient which was not I mean cannabis is known as a food ingredient for hundreds if not thousands of years like so. Um, but then, then she was having, so, so she accepted that and then had to go to the, to the novel foods. And then they came out and they had, there was the 1% THC limit. And then that was down, at one stage, that was down to 0.01%. It was any, no, there was no amount of, that you could have in, of THC involved in the hemp. For, I think for, that's the Irish interpretation. And that's why, that's why all our CBD shops are in, are in chaos. And they're all, we have, I think there's five court cases, live court cases going on at the moment. Uh, Little Collins and I don't know, I don't know. Uh, puff and stuff but there's a bunch of them and there's, there's one, a, the one that, 
There's actually a, a couple living nearby me in Carrigahoes. They make their own CBD oil and they, they sell it themselves, market it themselves and all the rest of that, but, and grow it themselves, obviously. They, and they have a license to do it. Like, I mean, they, they they went through the an amazing couple altogether. How, I mean, the, the patience it takes to go through the whole license approval scheme. But I couldn't believe when I took when they told me how they made the cannabis oil, <laughs> they can't they can't use the flowers. They can use yeah. the stalks, and that's it. Chris, it's shocking. Like the restrictions. How can you restrict something that's so part of this kind of green moment that we're trying to fight mm. fight at climate prices? How can you have restrictions on it? And it should be just opened up everything up, have industrial use, have every Ireland should be planted with hemp. From well, it's like I was saying, it was like, like, like I was saying to you before we started, like I, I think democracy is bundling. <laughs> it just like like your man uh, on, on The Simpsons said, democracy just doesn't work. It it's impossible. Like I mean, they're they, they overrated at least. Well, I mean, as as I was, as I was saying to you earlier, like I mean, the they're just. They're they're playing the they're trying to play it as cool as they possibly can, and they'll they'll be dragged kicking and screaming. Like there was one person I saw, I don't know, was it on pro program? It was on um, it was something. It wasn't something. This was to do with getting their child another medicine. It was it wasn't cannabis related, and the the, the heat of the hunt was that they had to educate the civil servants into the the whole area the, the medicine that they were trying to get for their child, and. Uh, and it took it took a lot of back and forward because the, you would you you didn't just hand them a report and they said oh I see that's fine they they then go off and they'd be they'd have to follow up all the time because these people weren't uh, go up and they, they whatever department or whatever way they were brought up to be civil servants they um it wasn't a case of go get her let's find let's get this thing job done it, it you know you kind of react they're very reactive they weren't uh, proactive yeah. at all so. Uh, I think that there there might be. Uh, I have a feeling that there there's a, a, a great deal of resistance within the civil service that they're a much more conservative bunch than than you know, because they're never on television. Who knows who? Well, they I are. believe I believe they're the barriers. To be honest, it, the, and I think and and every now and again they appear. We we see them bubble up. That's the most interesting thing for me about the citizens' assembly mm -hmm. is you're beginning to see the characters that you don't normally see who are who are big players in this uh, situation. And we have we've had health committees. There was one a very interesting health committee with a guy. I mean, we have uh, especially the the ep, you know the epilepsy in kids. I mean, that's the real heart string pulling. And we've had we've had our two young kids, Ava and Abby, die in this last month after years and years of Deborah Downey and Vera Toomey and everything that they were put through. Because it wasn't that they went through it; they were put through it by by the by the situation of the that the Irish government insisted upon. You know, it's it's just something off there in the distance. They don't have to. It's it's a minority of people that are that that are that, and they don't have a very coherent voice. Like I mean, so the I mean, I tried to ask I've, to get when I was more involved in activism, and I, I tried asking one person in particular to to come along and go to a demos and stuff, and he said, "There's just no way." Like I mean, he there's nobody knew that he was even good anything to do with cannabis and he had MS like so I mean uh, he, he knew somebody in the guards who said to him that the guardy send around people with cameras to all of these uh, demos and photograph everybody and whether that's true or not I don't know but he was that's what he was told and uh, imagine it, it is I mean, there's, there's there's if, if, if I mean if there most people are I mean 90 percent of people who, who are, are, are not under any suspicion by the guardy they're just kind of Drifting along and keeping the head down and and waiting for the day when next this time next year, who knows what the once the citizen assembly has has report has had time to be digested and percolated and buried in the garden and dug up again like in tunnel down and and I get it done. And, uh, and, have, you, and have you left the cannabis party behind? Is that um... well? I, it 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 um it it was. It, well, the idea is still there, and as as I was saying to you earlier, I I I I'm I'm kind of a, I'm holding the door. If anybody, if there's anybody out there who is a natural born politician and would like to um, to use my Facebook page to be able to and get you get an admin on it, and rather than starting, you have all the IP. I'm more than willing to hand it over to anybody who, who's. Um, there you go. We put the plea out there. You know, well, if, 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 if there's anyone out there. If there is, if there are people out there who are interested in progressing the political party notion, I mean, you're, you're. That's what you're at now. You're. Have you? Is your course wrapping up at some point? Then well, well, I'm only half. I'm only one third of the way through. I've, uh -huh. I've, I've three. Well, I've at least one, if not three. I'm trying to get two deferred for next year. 
So I have, I have, and realistically speaking, I have three projects to get done this summer. And then there's the second term, which will bring you up till December. Then I, there's, a, there's a module that I had to defer totally uh, because of my hunger strike and my preparation for the hunger strike in, in the circuit courts that, uh, I mean, for, for about, uh, I, my preparation for the hunger strike was okay, over four weeks. But I wanted to be, ask about that. Well, I mean, it was, it was I, I did it sensibly, like like the very first week I, uh, this was back in March, or no, in February, because my court case would start in March. So I was just starting this court, new course, but I, and preparing for hunger strike over a four week period. So, but it wasn't that bad. I mean, for the, for the first week, I just gave up all the junk food, then gave up all the, gradually tapered it down. But what I, what I didn't realize was that was the, I mean, afterwards, I was, I was, when I was in court, I, I mean, I, I literally had this, this hum, other human being held my life in his hands. If he had sent me off to off to prison, I was I prepared for hunger strike. I would I'd spent four weeks preparing for it. March, I think it's March the sixth of March 10th, I can't remember the exact date. I was in I was in the circuit court and it was only at the very last second. I he gave me eight months for all running, it was the longest sentence. So there's other three or four other charges all running concurrently. And and he and it, it looks like he was getting out of his seat to leave, having sentenced me to eight months. And then he just looked around and he suspended them for 14 months. And, but the thing, the, the reason I said to you about the reason I'm saying that was that, and um, afterwards, I, it was such a trauma. It was very traumatic to be sitting down doing this, give, listening to this guy who basically held your life in his hands. I mean, as an, as a, as a child, people are people are used to have their life, you know, put their lives in their parents' hands to look to, to look at them. And this guy, he basically could do anything he want. I'm like, I was like a, a leaf in the wind. He could do anything he wanted with me. And, uh, so, so I mean, for for about two or four weeks after that, I I just wasn't able to focus at all on the course I was doing. I I, I could I tried to do a couple of hours every day just to get something done, and uh, so I mean I I couldn't I wasn't up to following the course, so I got a deferral until next year, and so. And uh, so that's the the future for John John O'Regan, and to stay out of court, presumably now that you've well, yeah, uh, yeah 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 I'm, I'm got off this time. Time. if I if I if if I owned a car which I obviously don't I I and if I if I was to illegally park a car I was told my sister told me it's anywhere that would be enough I mean you're you're bound to the peace or to or be of good behaviour and something, something like that everything is bound to the peace, uh, which means that you can't be get into any trouble of any kind and. Uh, or otherwise, like my 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 eight months suspended would be reactivated, and and uh, that'd be that. I'd be straight off to prison. Yeah, so it's, a, it's you're kind of living under that shadow. And, yes, uh, it, it could happen in any. I'm I'm sitting here for the last three months since since then, and I mean, as I said this before to people that I mean, if it would be very easy for there to be a a, a a tiny small bit of cannabis on the carpet somewhere that I somehow my my Hoover hadn't collected it. And uh, and and if a guard was to find just a piece of cannabis there, that's that. You know, what I mean, he can decide to charge me, and then the sentence gets reactivated, and I'm off to prison for eight months. And but I don't know. I mean, I, I... Patrick Moore is down in is down in Limerick, yeah, and yeah. he's there. He got a five year sentence for doing nothing else except growing for people. And uh, and we can talk. We've talked for a long, long time there. And uh, but the, at the end of the day, this is it's very real. I mean, that's how close you were to, to, to jail. And that's where Patrick Moore is now and has been. Uh, I, have a, I have a count up clock on my website and I don't know where he's at now. He's at about 160 days or something like that. They put him in on December 2nd, like for happy Christmas. And he's got a young family and that's how bad this, this thing is. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so look at it. And I'm, I'm, glad, you're, I'm glad you're out. Right. comes out of the citizens assembly that that gets cleared up that people realize what each of the definitions are it, it it okay fair enough it stops people like myself and yourself getting any hassle but it still it still gifts the entire industry over to the hands of of uh, of criminals who, who who have no other way other than violence that to, to enforce to be able to protect themselves like so yeah. we'll I mean, chop up kids and put them in suitcases <laughs> there's no more there's no more dramatic to me there's no more no more dramatic image to put in it needs to be hammered home at people that's what <laughs> happens that's the but that's the product of prohibition and people need to understand that and stop kind of ireland has got a little bit glamorized about globe hate and all that kind of stuff with the tv series and things like that and you know everybody loves narcos on netflix and bullshit like that 
and they kind of translate it into an Irish context. And we have this dramati dramatization of, of the Kinnahans versus the Hutches, all that nonsense. And Jerry Hutch walking like, he, uh, like he's some kind of character, you know? But the thing is that that's a, se that's a separate world. You know, but that's that's that's. I feel quite strongly about decrim for that reason. That you, it's pro crim. You know, well, it, this, it'll be it'll be the first probably. It's the low hanging fruit to kind of say yeah. they they can use as an excuse that they're that it'll they still be something. criminalized for for any dealers. They will still be prosecuting, going after all people dealing in trafficking, but they will not be no longer be, be arresting people who are obviously just. And then you'll have this whole thing. What is personal use then? It's like I mean, how much is personal use then? Uh, I mean, it's it, there'll be well, we 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 can look forward. That'll be the debate. I think that'll be that'll be interesting to see. <laughs>